Jesus and Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. Lord, I thank you that we have your word. We have many questions. Yes, we do, but your word has the answers. And you've given us all the answers that we need to know. Lord, we thank you for the entire Bible, the New Testament and the Old. We know that all of it is for our instruction, for our encouragement, that we may have hope, that we may have hope in you. Lord, I pray that if I prove a distraction to your work, that you would remove me today. Lord, that this would all be about glorifying you. It would not be about me. I know that rocks and donkeys can do what I do and to do it way better than I do. So Lord, keep me humble and may your word receive, be received by your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in, in a group this size, I'm willing to bet that what I'm about to say will not be all that difficult to relate to. Has anyone here ever thought to themselves, I wish things were different? Anybody? I wish things were different. Perhaps you've been praying to God for something for a really long time, or you've been praying for God to do something. You've been waiting days, months, years. You think about your life and say to yourself, well, if it were up to me, it would certainly be a lot better. If it was up to me, things would be not only different, they would be better. I mean, isn't it time that something changed? Isn't it time that my prayer was answered? Isn't it time that my circumstances were changed? Isn't it time for an answer to this question? What is God doing? I don't see him working. Where, where's the excitement? Where's the sign? Where's my answer to prayer? Why do I have to wait so long? It seems like other people haven't had to wait as long as I have. Can't God see that if he would just listen to me, that things would be better? Why aren't things happening right now? Or why didn't it happen sooner? Why didn't this happen sooner? God, I know you have a plan, but can't you do it a little bit faster? God, I know you have a plan, but from my point of view, it looks kind of boring. It looks kind of bad. And God, I know you have a plan for me, but it doesn't look all that good. There may be someone out there who can identify with what I'm saying. Well, today's sermon, I believe, answers two questions that I think are at the heart of all those other questions. Is God working in my mundane, ordinary life? That's the first question. And the second one is, is God's timing always perfect? Is God's timing always perfect? Let's open up our Bibles to Genesis 37, verses 12 through 17. That's Genesis 37, verses 12 through 17. Now, Genesis is the first book of your Bible, and we're continuing our sermon series through the many colors of providence, where we see how God is providentially working in Joseph's life. Remember, again, that providence means... Providence is the means by which God enacts his perfect will in his creations. Providence is the means by which God enacts his perfect will in his creation. We've seen how God in his providence placed Joseph in a particular family and that he gave Joseph divine prophetic revelation, meaning that God gave his word to Joseph through a dream. And today we are going to focus on a passage that on the surface on its very surface, may not seem all that exciting or important. But if we believe that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable, which if you're here this morning, I hope that you do, then God has something good and true He wants to communicate to us. So let's read Genesis 37, verses 12 through 17. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, 
they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word. Now, if you're familiar with the historical account of Joseph, or you've read ahead, you're probably thinking, Tyrus, why are you stopping right here? Like, why would you stop? All the action is in the next 10 verses. All the action, all the exciting stuff, it's all going to happen in the next 10 verses. Why are you stopping here? Well, spoiler alert, for those of you who haven't read ahead or aren't familiar with the story of Joseph, what's about to happen in the next 10 verses is these really exciting things. The brothers, Joseph's brothers, are going to conspire to kill him. And then, but they decide not to kill him, but instead they're going to throw him in a pit. And when they've thrown him in the pit, they see Ishmaelite traders passing by at that moment and get an idea. Instead of just leaving him to die, let's sell him into slavery. So they sell Joseph into slavery, and then Joseph is taken to Egypt. Oh, that sounds really exciting, right? I mean, all the actions in the next 10 verses, Tyrus, can't we just talk about that? Can we move on to that? Well, the Holy Spirit inspired Moses, the writer of Genesis, to include this detail, which means that it has something that is important and profitable to say to us. So let's dive in. We're going to focus on two things this morning that I think will help answer the two questions. Is God working in my mundane, ordinary life? And is God's timing always perfect? So in this text, we're going to look at two different things to help us answer those questions. First is providence in circumstance. Providence in circumstance. And the next one is providence in character. So let's start with the first one, providence in circumstance. Verse 12 says this, Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. Well, why, why would they do that? I mean, it's obvious that, you know, Jacob and his family, they're shepherds. They, pa they pasture their flock, but it seems that they have need for better pasture. So the first thing that happens in the providence of God in the circumstances is that the sheep need better pasture. And so they move on to Shechem. Okay, all right. Again, not that exciting. You know, shepherds need to shepherd their flock. They need to go where the, gr the grass is green so that their sheep can eat. Where's Shechem? Shechem seems like a pretty good place to do that. Uh, Shechem is a city, and it's known for its fertile, fertile valley. So there should be plenty of grass there for the sheep to graze, and it'll be good for them. So they go to Shechem. But there's a problem with Shechem. And in order for you guys to understand that problem, I'm going to have to give you a little bit of context. Now remember, there are 12 brothers total. Joseph has 11 other brothers, but we often forget that he also has a sister. Leah bore a child whose name was Dinah. And unfortunately, Dinah got into a little bit of trouble in the city of Shechem. You see, in Genesis 34, we see that Dinah, while she was there, was taken advantage of. She was raped by the prince of Shechem. And she was kept there in his home. And Sickly enough, after he had had her, his way with her, he falls in love with her. And he says, I, I want to marry her now. And so what do you do? He tells his father, he tells his father, Hamar, uh, let's go to Dinah's father, who finds out about this, is understandably very angry. But he goes to Jacob and he says, please let my son marry your daughter. And Jacob knows what he's done. He knows what his son Shechem has done to her. And also, the brothers know what he did to their sister. We can understand they're very, very angry, and justifiably so. And so the brothers get an idea. They go to Shechem and his father and say, hey, we'll let you marry not only Dinah, but we'll let, we'll let you marry all of our women. But we can't do that unless you all get circumcised. And so Shechem says, okay, well, I'll do that. Not only that, I'll get all the other men to do it. So he goes back to Shechem, he circumcises himself, and convinces all the other men to get circumcised. Now, after that deal got struck, the brothers were being deceptive. They do not want their sister's rapist to marry her. And they devised a plan. Now, 
I don't need to tell you, but I feel like it's necessary for me to say this, but God takes rape very seriously. We really don't have to go very far in the Bible to recognize that. Deuteronomy 22, verses 25 through 27 says that any man who rapes a woman is to get the death penalty, and God himself compares it to the act of murder itself. So God takes it very seriously. But what I'm about to describe to you, what the brothers did to Shechem and the city, was not justice, it was vengeance. So we're just going to read, what was it that they did about this? Genesis 34, verse 25 through 30. It'll be up on the screen for you. On the third day, when they were sore, remember, all the men of the city got circumcised. So they're feeling pretty sore right now on the third day. The two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamar and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all of their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses they captured and they plundered. Now remember what I said, God takes rape seriously. According to God's law, which again hasn't been given yet, this is before the giving of the law, but nevertheless, God's eternal morals still apply. The only person who should have died was Shechem. But the brothers are out for more than justice, they're out for revenge. They not only kill him, they kill all the men, they plunder the city, they take everything, they take the children, and they take the women too. That's not justice, that's vengeance. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, when he finds out about this, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and and the Previazites. My numbers are few. And if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. So see, Jacob understands, like, look, you guys went too far. And now, if they see fit, they're going to, they may gather an army to destroy all of us because of what you've done. So now we can understand why Jacob might be a little concerned that he hasn't heard from his sons, who last he heard went to Shechem. That's a little bit of providence, isn't it? It's just at this very moment that Jacob says, oh wait, I haven't heard from them in a while. And after what Levi and Simeon did to the whole city, killing all the men. It's possible something bad has happened to them, not only to them, but to my flocks. Let's read verse 13. What else do we see? Israel said to Joseph, what does that mean? That means that Joseph's not with them. Joseph's not with the other brothers. It's possible that Joseph was kept behind. He remember he's the favorite son. Maybe Jacob says, eh, maybe it's too dangerous for my favorite son to go to Shechem. I'll keep him behind. Or perhaps maybe Joseph is the one who's kept behind because, you know, Jacob's getting older, he needs someone around. But nevertheless, Joseph's not with them. Joseph isn't with them. And then what does it go on to say? He, he gets concerned about the brothers and for the flock, and he says to Joseph, go now. Go right now. Not yesterday, not the day after that, not a couple hours, not go right now and go check on them. And so the Valley of Hebron, which is where they are staying, to Shechem, that's about 50 miles. 50 miles. For, for Joseph, that's most likely over a day's journey. And we assume he's going on foot. And you got to remember, he has to stop to eat. He'll have to stop to rest. It goes on even more. What else happens? So we got this 50-mile journey for Joseph. It just so happened on that day that his father had told him to go, but he gets lost. Joseph gets lost. Uh, Some commentators define this as a divinely ordained delay. Don't you wish you could think about every time you're ever late is that way? (laughs) A divinely ordained delay. But nevertheless, Joseph gets lost. And it just so happens that a certain man happens to see him there. And it just so happens that the brothers had already moved on from Shechem. And it just so happens that this man overheard the brothers and where they were going. 
And he tells them, yo, your brothers, they're in Dothan. Now, Dothan's 16, between 16 to 20 miles from Shechem. So walking there would take, depending on how fast Joseph's walking, that's five to seven hours. And I know what you're thinking right now. Tyrus, who cares? Who cares about all these little details? What, what does any of this matter? Who cares? God does. God does. Think about this. God, for his own redemptive purposes, decreed that Joseph would be in Egypt. That's God's decree. That's God's plan. That's what he divinely ordained to happen. So think about this. If the sheep don't need better pastures, the brothers don't go to Shechem. If the brothers don't discuss their plans to move to Dothan, this man doesn't hear them, just so happened to overhear them. If Jacob doesn't have Joseph leave at that time that he does, which is over a day's journey, he may not bump into this man. If Joseph isn't lost in that same field where the man happens to be, he can't tell him where his brothers are. And by the time Joseph gets to his brothers, they have moved on from deciding to kill him and instead to throw him in a pit, which by the way, who knows if there was a pit in Shechem, but there happens to be a pit right there in Dothan. And by the time they've thrown him in the pit, at that exact moment, you know who happens to be passing by is the Ishmaelite traders that give the brothers the idea, let's sell them into slavery. And where are the Ishmaelite traders headed? To Egypt. Is God's timing perfect? God's timing is always perfect. It's always perfect. He providentially uses circumstances to accomplish his will down to the smallest and seemingly insignificant detail. Amen to that. You know, I love Lord of the Rings. I love Lord of the Rings. I'm sorry, I do. But you know one of the things that drives me crazy sometimes? In The Hobbit... You know, before Lord of the Rings was ever written, you know, Tolkien, I don't believe he had that whole story figured out. But in The Hobbit, seemingly, all that happens to Bilbo is that he finds a ring in the dark. That's it. And the ring helps him turn invisible and helps him on the adventure. But Bilbo doesn't know that he picked up the most important object of all time and is going to lead to the destiny of his nephew Frodo and all the people of Middle-earth. This seemingly insignificant thing that happens. But God's timing is always perfect. That's what that that illustrates to us. That's what this story illustrates to us. But here's the thing. It's good to use Lord of the Rings as an illustration. I probably will do it again. But what does the scripture say about God ordaining everything? Let's go to Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 10. Let's Let's put this out there. What does the Lord say? Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Do you see this? There is no such thing as luck. There is no such thing as chance. There's no such thing as randomness. There is only God's sovereignty. That's it. Sovereignty means God's absolute rule and control as king over all creation, his rule and decree over everything that happens. But think about what would be the opposite. The misery of the opposite is that everything is chance, everything is random, nothing has a purpose do you, can you think of the misery of that? Everything in your life doesn't mean anything. Everything in your life is just random. There was no divine plan. God doesn't care. The misery and pointlessness of your life would be the opposite being true. Your life would have no meaning, would have no purpose, be nothing. We're all just, as the atheists say, we're all just matter in an uncontrolled, pointless universe. You have no value. There's nothing about you that is intentional at all. That's the opposite of what the Bible says. That's also, spoiler alert, the opposite of what's actually true. As Charles Spurgeon said this, no doctrine in the whole word of God has more excited the hatred of mankind than the truth of the absolute sovereignty of God. There's a lot of reasons for that. 
But I think one of the main reasons is this. It's man's inclination to believe himself to be wiser than God. That's one of the main reasons why people hate the doctrine of God's sovereignty, that God is in control. Because we think we're wiser than him. If God would just listen to me, things would be a lot better. If I was in control, things would be better, wouldn't they? But that's not true. Contrary to popular belief, you're not God, and neither am I. And praise God for that. You make a terrible God. Terrible. But I know that a burning question is coming up in your minds. But if God is sovereign... What does that say about the choices that we make? We even see in this text that decisions were made. Now, this is a subject we're just going to scratch the surface on this week, but next week we're going to do a more thorough look. So hopefully I can just whet your appetite a little bit and be patient. We'll dive into more stuff about this next week. But in order to help you with this, I think that the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith helps us with this very issue. It's my favorite confession, and it's chapter 3 of God's decree. This is what the confession says. God has decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things. Whatsoever comes to pass, yet so as thereby God is neither the author of sin, nor has fellowship with any therein nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor yet is the liberty or contingency of secondary causes taken away, but rather established in which appears his wisdom in disposing all things and power and faithfulness in accomplishing his decree. Again, long thing. Let me explain. God is absolutely sovereign and in control of absolutely everything that happens. That's what the Bible says. However, God has made the universe in such a way that we choose to do what we want to do. Every single thing you've done in your life, you did it because you wanted to do it, meaning God is not controlling you like a puppet, forcing you to do something against your will. That's what the confession says. It says, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature or liberty or contingencies of secondary causes. So God determined everything that takes place and yet... We are not forced to do those things which God ordained, but here's the kicker. We freely carry out God's decree. I know that's a bit of a brain twister, is that? So we're all, everybody does what they want to do, and everybody does according to the will of their nature. And yet, even though we do everything we want to do, we are, (laughs) we are doing God's decree. Do you think, again, I can't fully explain this, and that's why I love what's written here. All these things are true according to the scriptures, but are not fully comprehended by the human mind. It's true that God is sovereign and ordained and determined everything that's going to happen, and yet we freely make choices of our own will, and yet we carry out the will of God, and we can't, that sounds contradictory, but it's not. It's just so high that we can't comprehend it. Isn't that amazing? The reason the Bible doesn't reconcile these ideas is because we couldn't understand them. That's why. You have never been forced to do anything that you did not want to do, and yet you carried out God's decree because God has ordained the end from the beginning. Again, we'll talk more about that in greater detail next week, but let's that goes into the next point, which is providence and character. The first providence and character is this. Jacob's concern for his sons and his flock. Jacob had the concern. Jacob had the desire. Jacob wanted to know how his sons and his flock were doing. We also have the obedience of Joseph. His first is, here I am. Here I am, Father. What is it you want? How can I help you? Don't you wish your children responded that way? Here I am. What do you need? I'll do it. Not only that, Joseph does it right away. He said, go now. Joseph went now. But we also have the compassion of this unnamed man. Isn't it interesting? 
Joseph doesn't find this man. This man sees him, that he's wandering around, and feels sorry for him. He's like, oh, what's wrong with this guy? Doesn't know where he's going. Hey, what are you looking for? And that got me thinking. You know how many unnamed people are in Scripture that had profound impact? So many people. Here, here's a, and these unnamed men, they're not named, and yet the small things or even the big things they contributed fed into the redemptive plan of God. So here's a few examples. Gideon had 300 men. Gideon didn't fight that whole battle by himself. No, he had 300 men. We don't know their names, but God used them to win the victory. We know that the victory was the Lord. Ultimately, the Lord fought for them. It's not the strength of man. It's the strength of God. What about the wise men? We don't know their names. Now, Christian history has speculation about what their names were, but the Bible doesn't tell us who they were. What about the centurion who Jesus said, there is no one in all of Israel who has faith like this man. Guess what? We don't know his name. We don't know his name. You would think like, what? We don't know his name? The person who has greater faith than everyone in all of Israel and we don't know his name? But you might be thinking, Tyrus, aren't those people, they're, they're great warriors, great magi, a centurion. Those are great men. I'm nothing like them. Two people I want to point out who had small yet a profound ripple effect through history. Jesus tells his disciples before he enters Jerusalem to go get him a donkey. You ever think about the owner of that colt? The owner of that donkey? What are you doing? Our master needs it. Okay. That's all he does. And yet, he's fulfilling prophecy. The owner of that cult has no idea what's going on. He's minding his own business. All of a sudden, these guys come in and say like, hey, we need this. Okay. What if he says no? He didn't. That's all that man, from what we know, contributes to the greater narrative of redemptive history. And it's so pivotal and so important. And then there's my favorite, the thief on the cross. We don't know his name. We don't know his name. All the thief on the cross did, you know, all he did, all he's remembered for, all he did was repent. There's nothing in his life that makes him worthy of salvation. He didn't do anything to earn it. He couldn't contribute anything to his salvation. By the way, spoiler alert, neither can you and neither can anybody else. You cannot earn your way. There is nothing you contribute. And you know what? Praise God the account of the thief on the cross is there because that ends the debate right there. This guy is a rebel and a murderer. There's nothing. Only one reason he gets to heaven. Jesus, remember me. He says we are guilty. We deserve to die. I've done nothing that merits the salvation. I've done nothing to make me worthy. Just as faith in Jesus. What a beautiful story of redemption. And it's recorded for us, and it has encouraged me, and encouraged countless others, that it has nothing to do with what you do. It all has to do with repentance and faith in the only one who can save you. But that's it. Is God working in the mundane, ordinary lives? Here's something for you. The extraordinary God works in ordinary things. The extraordinary God is working in ordinary things. God uses everything. And nothing, listen, nothing and no one, nothing and no one is wasted no matter how small or insignificant you think you are or what you contribute, God does his best work with weak and ordinary people because those are the only kind of people that exist. Those are the only kind of people that exist. That's it. But there's one more person whose character I want to highlight here. Again, it'll be Joseph. Joseph's love for his brothers. Matthew Henry in his commentary says this, and this really, this really touched me. 
Matthew Henry says this, it is a very good lesson, though it is learned with difficulty and rarely practice, to love those that hate us. If our relations do not do, do, if our relations do not their duty to us, yet we must not be wanting in our duty to them. This is thankworthy. This is the part that really got me. Joseph was sent by his father to Shechem to see whether his brothers were well there and whether the country had not risen upon them and destroyed them in revenge for their barbarous murder of the Shechemites some years before. But here's the thing. But Joseph, not finding them there, went to Dothan, which showed that he undertook this journey not only in obedience to his father, for then he might have returned when he missed them at Shechem, having done what his father told him. He could have went back home. He did what his father asked him to do, but out of love to his brethren, and therefore he sought diligently till he found them. Does this remind you of anything? Does this remind you of anyone? Reminds me of somebody who out of obedience to the Father left his home and came down to earth who lived the perfect life without sin. He was born of the Virgin Mary, lived the perfect life, never once sinned, seeking not only to obey and glorify the Father, but out of love for those who hate him, dies on the cross, bearing the sins of his people, crushed under the just wrath of God. But on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. He paid the price in full for their sins. And he dies. But praise the Lord. Three days later, he rise again, victorious. Over the grave, the hope for us and for all those who repent to believe upon Christ and in Christ alone, We can be saved from the wrath of God that we should suffer in hell for eternity. We can spend an eternity with the Father and the Son who love us. And isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? How can we always trust that God's timing is perfect and that the extraordinary God is working with ordinary things? Well, I think Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5 shows us. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so we might receive adoption as sons. That's the truth, folks. In the fullness of time, Jesus died at the perfect time. He came at the perfect time. It just so happened that the cross hadn't been invented yet in the Old Testament. And when it is invented, the Romans, they nail him to a cross. But wait, the Jews are the ones who want to kill Jesus. But the Jews stone people to death. So they, they can't, but oh wait, we're living in a time where the Jews don't have the right to give the death penalty to anybody. So what are they going to do? They have to get Jesus tried as a criminal by Rome. And what does Rome do? They nail their criminals to crosses just so happened to be at the time where there was the most tension between the Jews and the Romans. Jesus died at the perfect time. And we can always look at the gospel and say, in the fullness of time, God sent forth salvation. So if he did that, is this timing perfect in my life? You know, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, if you're lost, if you're an unbeliever, and you've been convicted of every sin, every lie you've ever told, every misdeed you've ever, every thought that you've ever had that was lustful and wrong, everything that you've ever stolen, everything is piling up in your mind right now. I want you to know that in the perfect time you're here and within the sound of my voice to hear the gospel call. Repent and believe the gospel, you will be saved. You're not listening to this by accident. You're not here by accident. But for believers, what does this say to us? The sovereignty of God does not give us an excuse to be disobedient. It should actually inspire us to obedience. Why? Well, because God is using everything. The extraordinary God is working in ordinary things, including our obedience. So there's limitless applications for that. There's a few children in the audience this morning. Children, obey your parents. 
For God uses even your obedience, the obedience of a child, for his redemptive purposes. Even the smallest person can affect the future. That's right. When you obey your parents, even in the smallest of things, God is using that. Believers, what do we see from the unnamed man? What do we see from that? That we should seek to do as much good as we can, no matter how small the gesture may be. Because even the smallest gesture of kindness has ripple effects into the future, and God's using them. Even the smallest thing, the call to that person in the hospital, the meal that you made, that you had extra, so you gave it to someone else, even just, I'm lost, I need directions, help me. God's using all of it. He's using all of it. Share the gospel as often as you can in whatever venue you can. Facebook, one-to-one conversations, at dinners, at parties. Do it everywhere. Think about this. You never know. That person you share the gospel with could become the world's next great evangelist. My dad used to say that all the time. There's so many people who have these great names, who did great things for the Lord, and we know their names, but we, don't, we usually don't know the people that share the gospel with them. And yet, is their contribute, is what they contribute, is that any smaller? Not in God's eyes, it's not. Not in God's eyes, it's not. I said this last week, but I want you to say it again. Care more about being faithful than being significant. Care more about being faithful than being significant. Recognize that nothing in your life is wasted. Even the things that you perceive as setbacks. Man, I can't tell you how much I, how many times I'm like, what am I doing here? Isn't this such a waste of time? Why am I here? Why am I not there? I'm, you're exactly where God wants you. You have so many divinely ordained delays to your plans, and God, you think that it's a waste of time, and you think that it's derailing all of your perfect plan. No, turns out our plans are pretty pitiful compared to God's plans. Here's the thing, pray. Pray. But Tyrus, didn't you just say about God's sovereignty? Everything's going to happen the way it's going to happen, so why do we have to pray? Here's something to end that debate for me once and for all. God is sovereign over the ends as well as the means, and he providentially uses our prayers to accomplish his will. That's what the Bible says. That's right. We can't use the sovereignty of God as an excuse not to obey God to pray or to share the gospel. Why? Because he is using everything, including our obedience, which by the way, remember what I said earlier, we all do what we want to do. If you don't want to be obedient, a red flag should go up. You might not be a believer. Because believers whom God has changed their heart through the power of the Holy Spirit desire and want to do his will. So yeah, that's right, pray. What, what are the things you can be praying about right now? Well, there's a few things you can be praying about right now. And by the way, God is sovereign over those means, providence of our prayers. We could pray that Roe versus Wade be struck down right now. We could pray that the, those on the Supreme Court justice, their hearts would be afflicted and they would follow through to abolish it and it'd be gone forever. You know what else you could pray for? That those trying to get abolition bills in your states right now, that those would go through. The greatest holocaust of humanity has been going on for years and it might actually have a chance of being done and done away with. That's something to pray for. There's a million other things. But guess what? Here's what I know. Here's what I know. God's sovereign over the end, so whatever happens, it was in his will. But I know that he uses our prayers. So I want to be praying for God to do things that would bring about good. So pray. The other thing is trust God's timing. Trust God's timing. You're waiting to be in a relationship. You're like, oh, where, where, where is the right person? Where, where, where is my dream guy? Where's my dream girl? When's it going to happen? It'll happen at God's perfect time. What about the dream job? Oh man, I'm stuck in this dead end job. Like when am I going to find something else in God's perfect time? What about all the other opportunities in your life? When are they going to happen? God, why can't you just do it right now? In God's perfect time. Maybe you're waiting for a baby. 
you know, Rachel, let's talk about Rachel, Joseph's mother for a minute. You know, I said in my first sermon that Rachel and Leah had a battle over plants. A lot of commentators believe that those plants were actually rumored to have helped with fertility. It seems by the narrative that those plants didn't work. But what does the scripture say? God opened Rachel's womb. And he opened Rachel's womb at the exact right time. Because if Joseph isn't born when he's born, and 17 years later, this all happens, Joseph was born at the exact right time. And it doesn't matter how much you engage in those fertility medicines and everything else. I'm not saying that they're wrong. I'm just saying that the thing that's going to be the deciding factor over when that baby comes is when God opens the womb because that's the only way things happen. And it will happen at the perfect time and not before. And not before. And you know what's sad is that Rachel in this life, didn't get to see the fruit of why she had to wait so long. She had to watch all of the other servants, even Jacob's other wife, have baby after baby after baby. She had to watch it over and over. And God, what about me? And at the perfect time. Why? She didn't know then, but she knows now why. You just wait. Hindsight is twenty twenty, And oh, how great our sight will be when we're in eternity, when we see how everything was working together and how everything that we had to struggle through and everything we had to wait for, that was all at the perfect time. The last part, the last application is this. Tell stories about how you see God woven, wo- who woven the fine tapestry of your life. Just tell those stories. I waited so long, but then this happened. Then this happened. Tell your children God is faithful. And I can tell you, here's my testimony. So I figured I'd just close by giving you a little bit of my testimony. I didn't go to college right away. I joined the performance group for five years. Got to travel the country, got to meet amazing people. And after a few years, the director said, I want to, get, I want to help you make an album. I make the album. That album helps me pay for, to go to school finally, to go to LBC. During that time, because I had the album, I was doing solo shows. I did a couple solo shows on my own, and you know what solo show I did in Philadelphia at Highway Tabernacle? I met somebody pretty special that day. I bumped into who I didn't know at the time was my future wife. Don't make the album, that doesn't happen. It just so happened that my sister was attending that church and said, hey, you should get my brother to come here and do this. Providence again. And I know what you're thinking. That's when everything came together. Well, actually, no, I left and I forgot all about her. (laughs) She's since forgiven me. We're past that now. Um, (laughs) But anyways, but then you know what else happened? Well, I'm at LBC. My sister, who's been waiting for her boyfriend, who's dragging his feet for seven years, finally proposes. And then at her rehearsal dinner, which I didn't want to go to, And guess what? Nicole wasn't even supposed to be there, but plans fell through, and she goes to the rehearsal dinner she was never going to go to, and then what happens? We finally find each other. Finally, things work out. And then I'm at LBC, and here's the one that I really want to leave you guys with. The other stuff was just romantic nonsense. (laughs) But I'm at LBC, and you know what happens one day? Paul Mutchler brings in a wooden picture that describes a certain portion of scripture that I have so often neglected. It's a picture that has a certain man pointing the way for Joseph to find his brothers. And in that day, when I saw that picture, I said, if I ever preach through Joseph, I'm going to preach on that message. And it just so happens that today's the day. Is God's timing always perfect? Yes. And you can still see that picture. As far as I know, it's hanging in the prayer room at LBC right now. But see what I mean? We complain so much and tell God, you don't know what you're doing, when in hindsight, it's so clear, he knows exactly what he's doing. And every single thing that you do affects and God uses in his redemptive purposes and plan. God's timing is always perfect and he's using ordinary things to bring about his will. That's so true. 
I pray that encourages you today. But then a burning question. This whole discussion may be triggering a particular question in your mind. If God is sovereign, then how do we reconcile the reality of evil and suffering, the wicked things that people do, and the goodness of God? To answer that, I'll have to come back next week. Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for today. Lord, I thank you that you are the sovereign God and your plan is perfect. Lord, that you are using everyday ordinary things to bring about your purposes down to our decisions, down to what we perceive as coincidence. No, when we call coincidence is divine intervention. Lord, your timing is always perfect. It's always perfect. Help us to trust you. Help us to be obedient in the midst of us trusting you. Lord, it's a lesson we so often have to learn that you're God and we're not. I pray that we would learn that lesson in a greater way today. In Jesus' name, amen.